engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Good evening. It is nine after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News. We will get into all the stuff, even the stuff we don't particularly want to get into today, the the shooting and whatnot. But I want to actually, now that we are a week from the election, I want to kind of break things down for you in terms of the, the House and the Senate. Um, Here's the state of play for the House representatives. It is not optimistic uh, for the GOP, but um, there are some there are some signs of of hope there. Uh, I'm using the Real Clear Politics average, uh, and the Real Clear Politics what they do is they aggregate all of the polling, and in aggregating all of the polling, they. Um, they, 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 they do a very good job of weeding out bad polls, because if you're taking the average of all the polls together, you get a better sense. Uh, the good polls help weed out the bad polls and it all balances out in the end. Uh, if the election were held today, uh, there would be 205 Democrats elected and 200 Republicans elected. You need 218 to have a majority. That means there are 30 toss up seats. The bad news for the GOP is that there are only two toss-up races that are currently held by Democrats. Every other one of them is held by the Republicans. And again, with the Democrats being at 205, uh, the Democrats only have to pick up 13 of those 205 to take the majority of the House of Representatives. The average win for an out-of-power party in a midterm election is 25, and the Democrats only need to pick up 13 to take back the House of Representatives. Um, so, it, and that's that's if we have a blank slate, you know. Um, so, if the election were held today, 200 Republicans guaranteed to win. That includes flipping two Democratic seats. If the election were held today, 205 Democrats would win, and that would include flipping 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 Republican seats, some of them because of redistricting in Pennsylvania and and others, uh, leaving 30 seats. Now, here's probably what's going to happen. Republicans more and more feeling like the Democrats are going to take the House of Representatives. The uh, latest polling analysis suggests they may take it by 35 seats, uh, which would be more than the average, but not as big as some Democrats are saying 70 seats. But we still don't know. I mean, if the Republicans, if something happens in the next week, but keep in mind early voting is already going on, uh, and the Republicans hold all of these seats, well, then they win. They they take back they keep the House of Representatives. Again, there are th- right now based on the polling averages around the country, there are thirty toss up races. If the GOP has a really bad night, they have a really bad night, then you're going to see some of the lean Republican seats uh, drift away. And there are a couple in Georgia, uh, Georgia six. That's Karen Handel. Uh, Georgia 7, that's Rob Woodall. Those seats may go to the Democrats if the GOP has a really bad night. If the Democrats have a really bad night, uh, they're going to see Republican inroads into New Jersey and California uh, and parts of Virginia that the Democrats thought they had locked down. The real interesting story, I think, is not the House of Representatives, though. Republicans are behind the scenes now in Washington whispering that it's over. Right now, they're trying to mitigate damage by holding seats. They're beginning to run ads in places like uh, South Carolina's 1st Congressional District. That was uh, Mark Sanford's district. He was beaten in the primary. Democrats think there's a play there. When Republicans are having to spend money in seats like that, you know they're in a defensive position. They're trying to hold their own. Where Republicans are on offense is the Senate. So if the Republicans and the Democrats went to the polls today to vote, 44 Democrats would go back to the Senate. But 50 Republicans would go back to the Senate based on polling. 50 Republicans there would be six toss-ups. So even if the GOP loses 
every toss-up race, they still keep the Senate with the vice president breaking the tie. 50 Republicans. But, but, but let's dig into these toss-up races. What are the toss-ups? The toss-ups right now are not in are not North Dakota. Or North Dakota is a Democrat seat that the Republicans are going to win. Heidi Heitzkamp is losing North Dakota. And she is the the Democrats have already written off this race. They've stopped spending money there. The toss-ups are Florida, held by a Democrat Bill Nelson. Indiana, held by a Democrat Joe Donnelly. Missouri, held by a Democrat Claire McCaskill. Montana, held by a Democrat John Tester. Arizona, held by a Republican Jeff Flake, but it's an open seat. And Nevada, held by Republican Dean Heller. There's only one open seat on the map, Arizona. Now, what do the polls and the toss-ups say? Well, they say that Florida is a tied race, a slight advantage to the Democrats in Florida, both in the gubernatorial race and in the Senate race. The reason that the Democrats have a slight advantage in Florida is because of the devastation of Hurricane Michael. The panhandle is the most Republican part of the state, and the panhandle has been devastated by the hurricane. There are people who can't get home, and they're not all voting absentee. Some of them just aren't voting. Some of them are still staying with relatives out of state. Uh, That puts Rick Scott at a disadvantage in the Senate race and Ron DeSantis at a disadvantage in the governor's race. Indiana, Joe Donnelly had been expected to win re-election, to have a tough race, but to win re-election. The White House has sent both the president and vice president to Indiana. And after the Kavanaugh situation and Joe Donnelly voting against Brett Kavanaugh, suddenly the Republican is in the lead in Indiana. In Indiana, you suddenly have a really aggressive race. And the Republican, uh, Braun, is ahead of Joe Donnelly in the polling average by 0.5%. But here's the kicker. The last two weeks of polling of likely voters have come back with Brown up either four points or three points. CBS has him up three points. Uh, Mason Strategies for Indiana Politics has him up four points. And even the last Survey USA poll, which was done at the beginning of October, only had Joe Donnelly up one point. The Republicans may very well pick up Indiana. In Missouri, all of the late polling has um, has Josh Hawley ahead. Fox News polled the race at the very end of September, and it had a tie race. Uh, Missouri polling has polled it in the last uh, few weeks, and they had it up four. They had Hawley up four. I'm actually told by a number of of people who have done outside polling in this race that in a couple of the polls, Josh Hawley is up double digits. In some of the polls, he's up in the eight to nine point area. It sounds very much like Claire McCaskill is toast and the way she's campaigning uh, seems like she knows it. Montana is an interesting one because there haven't been very many polls there. And John Tester, John Tester was ahead in Montana. Uh, The problem with that is that he's routed all of his Senate staff to Montana to become campaign staffers, and you don't do that if you're comfortably winning. This is going to be a dogfight. The White House has sent uh, the president and the vice president out there. They're seeing signs that Tester may be beatable. Arizona has uh, Martha McSally now up. Uh, in the polling averages. She is ahead in the polling averages. She should keep Jeff Flake's seat. Kristen Cinema has turned out to be a terrible candidate, has a lot of baggage. Republicans have gotten highly energized out there. And then there's Dean Heller. He's ahead by a couple of points, but that's never good because a couple of points in, in Nevada could still be a huge Democratic turnout. We saw that with Harry Reid against Sharon Engel, but he's ahead in the polling. If you just took where people are ahead in the polls the Republicans would be picking up a minimum of three seats in the Senate. So if the toss-ups are split 50-50, the Republicans go up to 53 seats in the Senate, but the odds are that they go up to 54 seats in the Senate. That's a very big deal for the GOP. They may lose the House, but they'll still be able to put judges on the federal bench. So even if the Republicans lose a week from tomorrow in the House, they're going to have a good night in the Senate. But 
But, but, but that begs the question. What about the governor's races? What about Brian Kemp? I've seen the early voting numbers. I'll tell you what I've seen when we come back. You have trouble sleeping. Do you struggle putting your kids to bed each night? When you sleep poorly, how does this impact the rest of your day? Look, I'm excited to announce I'm partnering with Calm. It's the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. It was named App of the Year last year by Apple. And if you head to calm.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, you'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of premium programming, including sleep stories, which are bedtime tales for grown-ups designed to quiet your mind and relax your body. They're read by soothing narrators like Clark Peters from The Wire and Jerome Flynn from Game of Thrones. They're guided meditations on topics like anxiety, stress, and sleep, and they're soothing music and more. Now look, for a limited time, the Eric Erickson Show listeners get 25% off Calm Premium subscriptions at calm.com slash Eric. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. It includes unlimited access to all of Calm's amazing content that's going to get you drifting off to dreamland in no time. Get started today at calm.com slash Eric. Then go to sleep. Welcome back. It's Eric Erickson. I got to laugh a little bit. Did y'all hear the the uh, Democratic ad? It had DeBose Porter on talking about expanding Medicaid. Um, God bless him. I, I he it's it's very telling that his is the voice the Democrats have to use. You know who DeBose Porter is? He's the chairman of the Democratic Party in Georgia. <laughs> I mean, what does it say that the the chairman of the Democratic Party in Georgia has got to be the voice for the Democrats ad um, during conservative talk? Um, he's a, by the way, he's a very nice guy, uh, very nice guy. Um, he is a Democrat and a, he wants Stacey Abrams to win. And he, I was kind of surprised. They said this is DuBose Porter and uh, didn't actually say that uh, anyway. OK. We got to get into the early voting numbers here. What to, I, I don't have time. Listen, those of you who are on hold, just stick with me, please. I've got less than a minute here, and I give you the nutshell on early voting numbers, and I'll get into the details when we get back. Uh, the Democrats in Georgia are turning out the early vote, but normally in Georgia and elsewhere, Republicans run the absentee ballot game. Republican voters like to vote absentee ballot. And Democrats show up in early voting locations. So Republicans win absentee ballots and Democrats win win in-person early voting and they tend to outnumber the absentee ballots. Uh, This is the first time I can recall or anyone else I've talked to can recall Republicans in Georgia look like they're winning the early vote numbers by absentee ballot and in person. But it is very, very close, which is also somewhat unusual. More details when we come back. It's 39 after the hour. Uh, There is some news. The president has ordered now 5,200 soldiers to the border uh, to secure the border. And if we can't have a wall, he's going to send border personnel there. Let's go to the phones. Mike from Atlanta, you're up first tonight. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Um, My my question was... uh, I have two, actually. Um, But the first question is, how do you think the announcement of the 5,200 troops will affect uh, voter turnout? Um, Since uh, last time I checked, uh, 75% of people polled approved of enforcing the border. Um, And the second thing, um, me and my wife homeschool our kids, and in our homeschool group and in our church, uh, we have offered to watch anybody's children who didn't want to deal with them at the polling place uh, to, hey, you can leave your kids with us, go vote, and come back and pick them up. Oh, that is, <laughs> that is awesome. Well done. Well done. Uh, on on the border issue, uh, if, if we get into crass politics, people tend in midterm elections to vote against something than for something. 
And uh, the cynic in me honestly says the president sending 5,200 soldiers to the border, it's the right thing to do, but it also takes an issue off the table that he could otherwise use to motivate voters to go. Um, No one's going to go vote. Well, I, I won't say no one, but very few people will go to the polls and vote for the president's party and team because he did this, as opposed to going and voting for the president and his team because he's promising that if the Republicans keep the Congress, uh, this is what he's going to do. That That's kind of the problem. But as president, it's the right thing for him to do. Don't don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not saying he shouldn't do it. I'm, I'm just saying that it, it kind of does take the, t- the issue off the table for the GOP, uh, perhaps, but I suspect we're going to get back to this media coverage of what's happening at the border, and that's going to help the GOP. This issue really does wind up helping Republicans, and I saw a lot of Democrats initially thinking the president would start separating uh, parents from kids again, and that this would wind up hurting the GOP. That's not what's happening right now. Uh, Now, let's get back to early voting in Georgia. The data I have seen suggests the GOP is slightly ahead with early voting, but it is very, very close. The good news for the GOP is that they are ahead. But here's the problem with all the early voting numbers and why you've got to be very, very cautious in talking about early voting. No one can tell you who someone is voting for. What we can do is we can look at counties. And we can look at people. So, for example, the counties that uh, Hillary Clinton won in Georgia have generated 47% of the early vote. The counties that Donald Trump won have generated the rest of that. That's good for Brian Kemp. Numerically, we can look at people and we can say, have these people voted? And it looks like, based on what we're seeing numbers-wise, it is more Republicans voting than Democrats, and that's good. But again, the voting can't tell you who anyone voted for, and there's a problem for the GOP in this. So here's the issue, is I I can't tell you how any person has voted. Uh, With some data, I can tell you who has voted. And if that person is a regular Republican voter, then the odds are they voted Republican this time. If that person is a regular Democrat voter, I can. the odds are they voted Democrat this time. The problem is in voter intensity measurements. Voter intensity measurements is how Democrat are the Democrats and how Republican are the Republicans. And normally, if you vote in every Republican primary and every Republican presidential primary, the odds are you're going to vote Republican in the general election. Same with the Democrats. But there are there is polling and data out there that shows particularly in the suburbs People who have been Republicans, by and large, for the last decade are going soft on the GOP, largely because they don't like the president. Upper income, highly educated white Republicans in the suburbs are leaving the GOP. Uh, They're classifying themselves now as independent. And we don't have the we don't have the data shift to say that, because when they went to the polls last, they voted in the Republican primary in 2016. Uh, They in in this area, they largely voted for Marco Rubio. He won uh, the metro Atlanta counties. Marco Rubio did, uh, which was smart of Brian Kemp to bring Rubio into Cobb County. So they're listed as Republicans, but they've had a change of heart over the last two years and now would consider themselves independent. And they're voting and we don't know. Are they taking their frustration out on the president by voting for Stacey Abrams? Some of them appear to be. The question is how many of them are doing so. The data I've seen suggests not enough for Stacey Abrams. The data I'm seeing suggests that Stacey Abrams is not generating the ground game that she has said she would vote or that she would generate. We still have another week of early voting, though. And so things are very close right now. Uh, They are close. The Kemp folks seem to be very nervous, but they also seem to be very optimistic and upbeat um, because the trend lines for the GOP show some strength. Uh, that they haven't necessarily had in the past. They also have the vice president coming in for three stops. The vice president, all of the campaign data I'm seeing out there shows that the vice president does not turn people off in the way the president sometimes does, that when the vice president comes in for you, he mobilizes Republican voters, but he doesn't necessarily mobilize Democrat voters. The data I'm seeing for the president suggests that when the president comes in, 
Democrat voters get mobilized as well. So you bring the vice president in for three stops. You mobilize Republicans without mobilizing Democrats. That amps up Republican turnout. So when the president does come in next week, the Democrat mobilization will already be offset by increased Republican mobilization. Also, the president will be going to middle Georgia, where all of the data suggests he's in highly Republican areas without those surrounding suburbs that have gone wobbly on him nationwide. So he won't risk firing up Democrats the way he might have in some other states. Uh, This looks to be good for the Kemp campaign. They're executing their strategy and they're deploying their strategy and they're giving people reasons to vote for him, not just against Abrams. But what about the voter suppression story from Abrams? Ah, Some green room gossip from Washington, D.C. when we come back. So I just realized something somewhat monumental. It's Monday and we got a caller. We never get calls on Monday. Um, Not that we're not happy to take your calls. We just never do. And and tonight we got one. So I'm, I'm impressed. Um, let's see how much time do I have here? Cause I went long. I don't have a ton of time. When we come back, we do need to get into the other news of the day. We need to discuss the shooting and the fallout from the bomb. And I have become part of the news cycle and did not intend to be part of the news cycle. Uh, there is an organized mob, uh, working very hard online to harass NBC news and Chuck Todd from meet the press to keep me off Meet the Press. I was on yesterday, and they are outraged beyond belief that I would be on Meet the Press. I will play you the audio of what I said and see if you can find where the outrage is. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it's clearly organized. Media Matters of America even admits that on Friday they reached out to NBC News for comment, which, which shows they already had the story in the works uh, even before I showed up. And I'm just, you'll just have to listen to what I said and then listen to the soundbite of what the president said about the attack on the synagogue. Thank you to Mary on Twitter who says, I promised I'd talk about what I heard in the green room. I didn't have enough time when we came back in the last segment, and then I would have forgotten it had she not tweeted to me. So thank you. <laughs> Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. It is nine after the hour. The phone number 404 872 wsb talk I-, I should put this picture on Twitter at this time of year. I literally keep a post-it note dispenser right by my laptop with a pen and have to start writing notes all over of what I say I'm going to talk about because otherwise I'm there is so much in the run-up to the elections, I just I forget stuff. So I was on Meet the Press yesterday with Chuck Todd, a uh, good roundtable discussion. It has now gotten Media Matters to organize a, a protest. Poor Chuck Todd, I, he's a really great guy, and I, I, I sent him a, just a note saying I'm sorry to— to cause you turmoil on this, um, it did not unintentionally intend to be a distraction to meet the press. It was a good show yesterday, um, but uh, progressives are very, very angry that he had me on because they consider me an unreasonable voice on the right. The only reasonable voices they consider on the right are those who have uh, rejected Trump and the Republican Party and become liberals themselves. And so I'm kind of caught in the middle as someone who is not an ardent defender of the president, but not a leftist. Uh, They hate my guts in particular because they can't pigeonhole me. And so they're out to get me. Um, But when I was in the green room yesterday, you've got a very nice, large green room at NBC in Washington and a bunch of people uh, are all in there. And everybody gets talking about politics because everybody in there talks politics. And the consensus of the of a lot of national pundits is that all of the uh, voter suppression chatter from Abrams is actually helping her turnout, uh, not hurting her turnout. I have really been under the impression, and I think the data has suggested that there are a lot of people who hear these stories about Brian Kemp stealing the vote, and none of them are true, mind you, but they hear these stories and they think, oh, well, why bother go voting? He's just going to steal the vote anyway, so they stay home. But 
the national pundits who pay attention to these things think that uh, they see polling that suggests it has turned it has more concretely turned female voters towards Abrams and increased the black vote beyond what it would otherwise be. I'm not sure that's there, but they seem very convinced of it. I don't know what data they're seeing that I'm not seeing. Uh, nonetheless, um, it, there is still so much confusion. I did sit around with a couple of them and explain that this actually isn't a big story. Uh, no voters have been thrown off the rolls this year by the Secretary of State. Uh, voters were cleared out of the rolls last year. There's a federal law requiring it. Brian Kemp did it. And those voters had been contacted by the Secretary of State and in four years had not contacted him back. Uh, so they cleared them out, uh, which they're allowed to and required to do by federal law. And when you explain it that way, they're like, oh, that's it. Yes, that, that, that that's it. Uh, the Secretary of State's office does not actually clean voter rolls in election years because they know it looks bad. So they've they've amped this up further. Now you've got Jimmy Carter, of course, who's come out. He's a, been an Abrams supporter anyway, and he's come out and said that Brian Kemp should resign using the authority of Mr. Go in and ensure fair elections to try to help Stacey Abrams. Um, there's clearly they generated an entire story about this. They, they generated an entire and, and the reason they did it, it's political jujitsu, if you will. Turning your opponent's strength into his weakness, Brian Kemp has been a very good Secretary of State. He, in a year in 2016, where it could have been very close in Georgia, one way or the other, he worked very hard on the integrity of the election, despite a lot of criticisms from other people. Kemp worked very, very hard to ensure that Russians couldn't interfere with our election, that our database couldn't be hacked. There have been allegations that that has happened. It hasn't happened. He's been a very good Secretary of State. And what the Abrams campaign did is they decided to attack him on that, which I think it's fair to say that the Republicans really didn't see coming. Uh, her voter suppression, her th throwing people off the vote, throwing people off the ballot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or not off the ballot, but off the, the voter rolls, uh, the pending voter issue, the voting machine issue, on and on and on. And on calling into question his competence as Secretary of State when he's actually been a very good Secretary of State. Now, it was an interesting move. And the national pundits who look at this seem to think it has helped her. I'm just not sure that it actually has. And by the way, the the overwhelming consensus of people in the green room is that at best she's going to be able to get into a runoff, but that she still can't win. Um, but we'll see. It depends on on voter turnout. OK, I want to play this exchange between Chuck Todd and me. Uh, and it's relevant to the news over the shooting and people losing their minds. It, I just it, I want you to listen to this, and, and I want you to, to understand before you hear this that this exchange is getting Chuck Todd hate mail from progressives who believe he should never have had me on Meet the Press. Listen to this. Is it to purge this stuff? Whose Look, job is it to educate Americans to facts? I think we all have an obligation here. I, I mean, just let me address conservatives for a minute. Last week, uh, you had a lot of people pushing the maybe this bomber Not was... Not Rush Limbaugh was pushing it, Eric. Uh, you had a lot of people who were pushing this theory. But now we know the facts. Now we know the facts. And yet there are still people pushing this. I got to tell you that from my perspective, when we know all the facts now about the guy last week and you're still pushing this theory, you're at war with the truth. And if you're conservative, who's at war with the truth, you're not really being conservative. Um, Rush Limbaugh is, was questioning the stickers on the van. Across the board, we saw a bunch of conservatives doing this. Now we know the facts. The question is, do they continue? The problem is, in this situation, we have a lot of people who no longer trust the media. They don't trust institutions. They don't trust their neighbor. Uh, we've gone inward. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I do think it's going to be an external threat that brings us together. There is nothing left in this country that unifies us as a whole. We all have our own different media outlets. We have our social media outlets. We have our people we engage with, and they're not our next-door neighbor anymore. Nobody has a sense of community. So the 11 people Dying is not the tipping point. Well, uh, that's uh, sadly what you guys yeah, are all agreeing. We had James Hodgkins in last year, a yeah. mass assassination attempt on Republicans. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, that has progressives outraged. And they're outraged because they thought Chuck Todd should have yelled at me more for things I have said that the left doesn't like or that he should have forced me to condemn my friend Rush Limbaugh. Which I I was I was not going to condemn Russell Ball. He and I looked at this incident last week. We we saw it differently, um, and, but and we didn't know the facts at the time. Now we know the facts. Um, it, it's just 
it's astonishing to see people go out of their way to uh, decide they can decide who should and should not be on TV, and they should be able to regulate the other side. Uh, Julia Yaffe, I have no idea how you pronounce her last name. She was on Jake Tapper yesterday while I was on Meet the Press. She was on with Jake Tapper on CNN. She had this to say. Listen to this. Right, right. Uh, a caricature of a Jew being shot execution style with the subject line being we're on to you. And, I, you know, I think it's interesting that now Melania is or the first lady is now, you know, her campaign is be best and it's against cyberbullying. But when there was a clear example of cyberbullying, she said, well, the victim provoked it. Well, that's, and I, and I have to hold on. Please don't interrupt me. I, I have to I have to agree with Simone here. I think, you know, this president, one of the things that he really launched his presidential run on is talking about Islamic radical radicalization. And this president has radicalized so many more people than ISIS ever did. I mean, the way he talks, the way he, the it, way he, that is, that's just, it's, it's the way he talks, the way, the way that he uh, allows these people, the way he winks and nods to these groups, the way he says, I know I'm not supposed to say it, but I'm a nationalist, the way that he hems and haws when he has to mm -hmm. uh, condemn these people and kind of th gritting his teeth, kind of says, fine, okay, I condemn this, but then, you know, and Jake, all his... Jake, for, 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 for you not to push back on that... You're about to your push back on but, but to bring... That's your for her to say that the President of the United States has radicalized more people than ISIS is irresponsible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, and she did apologize for it. You, you should know she did apologize for it after it was over. Uh, but Jake Tapper is getting attacked for having her on in the way Chuck Todd was getting attacked for having me on. The, the right against Jake Tapper, the left against Chuck Todd. Uh, and they were moderating roundtable discussions. When you moderate a roundtable discussion, if you're a host on, on TV, you expect the other side to chime in and disagree, which happened with this. Uh, personally, here's my thing. I really like that she said that on TV. No, I don't agree with it. I think it's refreshing to hear people be that honest on TV, that this is what she believes. She really believes the president radicalized more people than ISIS, which is an insane thing to say. And we should be able to put her in the insane column. What, what the left is upset with Chuck Todd about is that he, he gave me a veneer of reasonableness when they don't think I am reasonable. And they don't like the fact that I went on and said something sane that people agree with. And that Chuck Todd let me get away with saying something. It's a very bizarre thing where the, when the left decides and now some people on the right decide that you are an unreasonable nut, you're not allowed to be on TV. You're not allowed to have someone else say, you know what, actually y'all are wrong. This person's reasonable or at least have them on and give them their say. She has exposed herself to, I think, having an insane belief. But uh, the the whole idea that conservatives should be able to say you can't have on this leftist. Or leftists should be able to say you can't have on this conservative. What you ultimately get to is that you're not allowed to have anybody on unless I agree with them. And that then would make for some very boring television. You have trouble sleeping. Do you struggle putting your kids to bed each night? When you sleep poorly, how does this impact the rest of your day? Look, I'm excited to announce I'm partnering with Calm. It's the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. It was named App of the Year last year by Apple. And if you head to calm.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, you'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of premium programming, including sleep stories, which are bedtime tales for grown-ups designed to quiet your mind and relax your body. They're read by soothing narrators like Clark Peters from The Wire and Jerome Flynn from Game of Thrones. They're guided meditations on topics like anxiety, stress, and sleep, and they're soothing music and more. Now look, for a limited time, the Eric Erickson Show listeners get 25% off Calm Premium subscriptions at calm.com slash Eric. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. It includes unlimited access to all of Calm's amazing content that's going to get you drifting off to dreamland in no time. Get started today at calm.com slash Eric. Then go to sleep. It is 26 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. Now, uh, Craig from Kennesaw. We're going back to the Volans. Welcome, Craig. How are you? Hey, Eric. How are you? Great. Hey, quick question. Do you think that maybe the basis of the incivility in Washington right now is that unlike back in the 90s with Gingrich and Clinton and the 80s with Reagan and 
Chip O'Neill, where they both all could say we could do business together, that there's really a basic uh, misunderstanding or a basic belief that the, the Constitution, breaking the law, that kind of stuff, these are really non-compromisable positions from a Republican standpoint. But it seems like that from the Democratic standpoint, these are you can compromise that. Hey, we'll look so, at the Constitution here. We won't look at the Constitution. I, I hear this argument a lot, Craig, and I think there's a little bit of merit to it um, in that uh, it basically it's the low-hanging fruit argument. We've taken all the low-hanging fruit. Now there's just complicated stuff nobody can agree on. I really think what it is is that we're a 50-50 nation, and both sides have to keep their bases mobilized. They're not trying to woo people to their side. They're just mobilizing their bases, so they fight and bicker over every issue instead of trying to work together on resolution, because once you resolve it, they've taken it off the table as something to use to keep people mobilized. It is 39 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. I want to play you a very quick soundbite from the president uh, at a campaign rally um, regarding what happened in Pittsburgh. This evil anti-Semitic attack is an assault on all of us. It's an assault on humanity. Through the centuries, the Jews have endured terrible persecution, and you know that. We've all read it. We've studied it. They've gone through a lot. And those seeking their destruction, we will seek their destruction. Good for him. I'm glad he said it. Um, I, I, y'all, I, I got to say, I, I am a little bit frustrated with the attacks in general on the media. And if you're a regular listener, you know, I got a lot of problems with a lot of reporters and I call them out on here regularly. There are some deeply biased reporters out there who peddle a lot of left-wing nonsense about the president and his supporters. And I try to push back on it. I try to push back on the prevailing narratives that get in uh, into the New York Times and elsewhere. But I don't think it's helpful to call the press the enemy of the people. I, I really don't think that is helpful. Um, there is a sick symbiotic codependent relationship between the president and the press where he attacks them. They report about it. He responds to the reporting. They report it. He responds. He attacks again and on and on and goes. And I am deeply troubled by more and more malevolent souls in politics turning violent. Uh, we've had James Hodgkinson. Y'all, we had the, the Sutherland Springs church shooting. We've had this um, synagogue in Pittsburgh, a beautiful city, uh, and, and to see this happen there. We've had this guy sending bombs to the media. And it, it's worth pointing out again that they didn't explode. They were poorly made, but they weren't fake bombs. They were intended to be real. He just was an idiot. And I, we got to, I think all of us play a role in this. What I'm also very frustrated by are the number of people who think that this is all the president's fault. We elected him. But more than that, it advocates responsibility for people on the other side as well. To fixate on the president is to say that the president can persuade us to do things we otherwise would not do but for his persuasion. And it's also to abdicate responsibility for people on the other side who fired up James Hodgkinson to go out and commit mass murder. Or Floyd Lee Corkins to go out and try to shoot up the Family Research Council. Nobody wants to talk about that. It's it's very frustrating because I feel like more and more I'm out there saying, you know what, Mr. President, you shouldn't say this. You can go after the media, but I wouldn't call them an enemy of the people. Do it in a different way. Um, and and you get attacked from your own side. Yeah, they are the enemy. He's right. He's right. They, they, they all need to die. I've, I've gotten stuff like that. And then you get attacked from the left. Well, the Republicans, conservatism is racism. And so unless you're going to condemn conservatism, you're a racist just like Trump. So screw you. I, I, I get it from both sides and it is exhausting. But I still think these things need to be said. We sh could all behave better. The president as well. The president excels at saying in public what people say in private often. And he's gotten people to feel comfortable about themselves saying things in public that they normally in the past only said in private among their friends. And he's not the cause. He's a symptom. 
the president did not create this atmosphere. He did not. And progressives who say he's created this atmosphere are wrong. And they also don't want to point any fingers at people on their own side to say these people too are contributing to it. It's a very one-sided conversation. And so I get the frustration with the media, but I don't think they're the enemy. There are bad actors in the media, but the media, the press itself, I don't think is the enemy of the people. Now, back to the phones, Charles from Stone Mountain, or if Stacey Abrams gets elected, Stone Rubble. Welcome. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. Yes, uh, I had a question about uh, voting in uh, North Florida, you know, where they had the hurricane, yes. where the cities have been totally destroyed. How are those people going to vote? Have they made arrangements for that? So they have put in um, the polling locations are operational to the extent that they've had to bring in portable buildings for voting. They have Uh, the problem is getting the people back home. A lot of people have their they don't have houses to stay in. And so they've moved out of state to stay with relatives or to a different location. Uh And they're going to have to drive back to that location or they're going to have to request absentee ballots. Now, my understanding is the Florida Secretary of State has been proactive in reaching out to people in the area and saying, if you need an absentee ballot, we'll get you one. Just let us know. Um, But people have to do that. Right. Okay. Okay. Yep. That's it. Thanks very much for the phone call. Yeah, that 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 folks, it's going to be that that puts a disadvantage on the Republicans in Florida because that area is so heavily Republican. Um, Notwithstanding that, they brought in portable buildings They made it a top priority to get voting locations up to snuff to be able to do this. It's just a matter of getting people back home. It is 53 after the hour. Hey, did you guys, have you noticed we had this awful tragic shooting over the weekend and there are there's not a rush into gun control conversations as there was when President Obama was president. Um, and I don't know why that is. I, I'm wondering if it's the Democrats are concerned with um, it may mobilize Republican voters in the run up to the midterms or that it was handguns and no one is uh, really out there calling for confiscation of handguns except on the fringe. I, I don't know. It's just very interesting that this happened and there isn't this sustained yelling about gun control uh, as there has been in the past. I don't know. I just, I find it unusual. Uh, not not unusual in a bad way, though. I'm, I'm kind of glad. It, it's nice that people aren't rushing off screaming about uh, gun control in light of a tragedy, although the, the response has been to rush off and blame the president for it, uh, which is also tragic. Um, just a personal note, I, I will be here tomorrow evening. Uh, in the morning, however, uh, with metronomic regularity, as you know, we have to have uh, Christie's CT scans of her lungs for her cancer. And so we will be doing that in the morning. And, you know, she takes a pill. She doesn't take regular chemotherapy. Whenever I tell people she has lung cancer, it's gen- she never smoked. It's genetic. Um, people always um, say, oh, ask how chemo is. She doesn't actually take traditional chemotherapy. Her lung cancer is caused by genetic mutation that causes her body to produce a protein that the cancer then thrives on. And so she takes a pill that keeps the protein from um, being created. So the tumors can't grow. She has lots of tiny tumors in her lungs. And so we have the scan tomorrow. And this medicine that she's on, after about two, two and a half years, tends to not work for a lot of people. And today is her two-year anniversary for this medicine. So obviously we're we're a little bit nervous, but... Uh, more and more research has been going on into this cancer that she has and the specific type of mutation she has. People are being shown to be able to use this medicine five and six years later. It's still working. So we're optimistic tomorrow, but it's just, it's always kind of nerve wracking. And on top of everything else, these last couple of weeks, um, it just feels like a great pile on. And so the weight will be off my shoulders, hopefully tomorrow evening. So we appreciate your prayers very much for her. Um, yeah, let me let me go there. Uh, I wasn't going to, but I am. We haven't talked a lot about the bomber today at CNN. In the it was actually at a at a post office near CNN where mail was being routed to be delivered to CNN. They found another bomb from the bomber. 
He was held in police custody last week. They asked him if there were any more bombs, and he refused to say anything. I am still today seeing people say that this bomber was a setup, that it was some George Soros-funded nut job who they paid off to take the fall when really they were trying to fire up their pace. I'm actually shocked by the number of friends I have, not in politics, just in, in regular society here in Georgia, who really did believe this idea that the bomber was some progressive trying to mobilize the progressive base by doing this. And we now know it's not true. And I know some of you have seen he was a registered Democrat. That's not true. Um, the pictures you're seeing online showing it have been photoshopped. It's been confirmed by multiple outlets, including Fox News, that he was a registered Republican. He registered in 2016. He did not vote in the presidential primary. He registered late and voted for the president in the general. His social media was full of him showing up at rallies, holding anti-CNN signs, among other things. Very, very pro-Trump guy. And I don't think we need to run from that. Uh, a, a crazy guy is a crazy guy. And, and he, he, we shouldn't paint all Trump voters that way. Uh, that's not fair. But I got to say, if you're still out there today peddling the conspiracy theories that he was some sort of progressive plant, you're at war with the truth and you shouldn't be at war with the truth because there is real truth. If you don't believe there is real truth, you can't believe there's God because God is truth. So don't be at war with the truth, people. 